Thank you for watching today's message from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Our message today is... You may remain seated. Our sermon text for this morning is our first lesson from Genesis chapter 3, and I'll be reading through that during the sermon. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Dear sinners whose only hope of salvation rests squarely on God's gracious promises. Chris's father had told him not to play baseball in the front yard by the driveway. But Chris and his friend Alex had been out there doing it anyway. Chris's dad could hear the crash from inside the house, and he knew exactly what had happened. Chris and Alex ran scrambling into the backyard and hid behind the bushes back by the fence. Chris's dad waited inside for a moment before deciding how to go outside and deal with his son. He stood on the other side of the bushes from where Chris and Alex were hiding. He said, Hey, Chris, you, you want to tell me what happened out front? Chris, of course, stood up and stared at the baseball that his dad had pulled out of the front seat among the shattered glass. I don't know, Dad. Well, Alex thought it would be better for us to play out front because there's more room, and we weren't hitting the ball at the, at the car anyway. You can feel the tension in that scenario, right? I bet if I ask you to raise your hand, you've been in a scenario similar to that. You squirm a little bit. You feel anxious because, because that guilt from that sin. Chris knew that he did something wrong. He knew that he should confess it. But his sinful nature, his, his fear of punishment, his own pride kept him from, from letting it go, from confessing. And we've done that too, haven't we? We've known that we did something wrong and, and even had an opportunity to come forth and, and, and confess our sin and we've been too proud, too ashamed, too, too afraid to confess. Now, I'm guessing most, if not all of you, have, have been in that position of, of Chris on that side of the bushes, but I wonder how many of you have been in the position of Chris's father the dad in that scenario. The dad whose relationship with his son has just erupted because his son has broken a very clear command. If you've been on that side of the bushes, if you've been on that side of the scenario, then you know the heart of a father who wants to amend that relationship with his son, who wants to get this sin out of the way as quickly as possible. I hope many of you have had the opportunity to be in that situation because it will, it will help you understand the theme for this sermon this morning and, and what's happening in these verses from Genesis chapter 3. The story of the fall into sin is a familiar one for most of us. Adam and Eve ate from the tree that they were forbidden to eat from, the one tree that God had told them, do not eat from it, and they fell into sin. God comes to them in these verses like a loving father. And as we watch how God deals with these sinners, our ancestors, Adam and Eve, the first human beings, we see how God deals with us as sinners today. Like a, a loving father coming to his child, coming to his children, and calling out to us in love. The Lord speaks to us in love, calling us to repentance and assuring us of his forgiveness. Let me read again these verses from Genesis chapter 3. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, 
What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. God wants us so badly today to take note of the way that he lovingly deals with sinners that he actually inspired Moses, the writer of the first five books of the Bible, to mark off this section of Scripture in a very special way. You see, in the first chapter of Genesis, which deals with God's creation, his blessings for, for all people, for, for the entire universe, he shows God's creative power and uses the name for God that we spell G-O-D, God. That name that emphasizes his creative almighty power, his rule over everything. But as we get into Genesis chapters 2 and 3, Moses, or, yeah, Moses changes the name that he uses as he refers to God because God is not just dealing with his entire universe and his creative power. He's dealing graciously with Adam and Eve, his dear children. And specifically in this section, Genesis chapter 3, you hear again and again, the Lord God, the Lord God, the Lord God. He used that term, the Lord, which you have written in your Bibles with all capitals, L-O-R-D. And it's a very special name that people didn't use outside of God's covenant people. God had not revealed himself as the Lord to anyone but those who knew his covenant promises. It's there in the burning bush that God tells Moses for the first time, I am, and gives him that name, the Lord, the covenant God, who would forgive the sins of his people, who wanted a relationship with them. The rest of the world, they worshiped God's G-O-D, but only the people of Israel, only God's covenant people, knew the one who is called the Lord, the gracious, the compassionate, the merciful and forgiving God. And it is the Lord that Adam and Eve disobeyed in this section. Eve listened to the snake, and along with her husband, they ate from the forbidden tree. And there's so much that we could say about that fall. If we'd go back just a few verses and focus on that, Eve should have known that snakes don't talk. She should have cut off that conversation right away. How could she have desired this one thing that God had forbidden them to, to take, to have? He had given them everything else. He'd given them a beautiful home. He'd given her a wonderful relationship, a perfect relationship with her husband provided all of their needs, all of their necessities, and yet she still wanted more, something that God had forbidden her. And Adam, he was right there with her. He knew what was happening. He accepted it, and he went along with his wife into sin. It was him that God had given the command not to eat from the forbidden tree, and he was supposed to lead his wife in, in obeying God's commands and doing good rather than following her into evil. They both failed. They both did the opposite of what God commanded them to do. But as much as we might be surprised about Adam and Eve and how they tossed away paradise and turned against God, the same could be said about us too. You and I know God's law. We know God's law better than most people in this world. We have the privilege of, of hearing God's word week after week, day after day. We know what God demands. We know what his commands are. And yet, it seems that the more and more we know of God's law, the more and more we recognize how often, how constantly we are breaking his law and turning against him and disobeying his commands. And sinning, it's not wise, it's not intelligent, it's damaging, it hurts other people, and yet we continue to do it again and again and again. And just like us, Adam and Eve were aware that what they had done was wrong. They were reminded right away because the, the, the perfect bodies that God had given them, they were suddenly ashamed of them. They were filled with shame and, and tried to cover their bodies with fig leaves to hide their shame. Notice the, the foolish decisions that they're already making. Fig, fig leaves would be a terrible covering. They would not last very long at all. They'd be so flimsy. They're already making bad decision after bad decision. Sin had so warped their understanding and their choices. 
Then they heard the Lord God coming to, to speak with them, to walk with them in the garden, and they were overcome with fear. Sin had so destroyed their decision-making processes that they, they went and hid from God, from the all-knowing God, in the garden that he had made for them. God came and approached them, knowing full well what they had done, completely understood everything that had happened. Just like Chris's dad, God didn't need an explanation to help him understand the mess that Adam and Eve had made. But yet he called for Adam for a reason. He wanted to give him a chance to repent. God could have just blasted them out of the garden. He could have burned the whole thing up and just started over. They disobeyed his command. He could have come at them with with anger and punishment, but he doesn't. Notice, not even a word of condemnation yet, just his mere presence, until Adam denies even twice that he had any responsibility for what happened. Where are you? Are the first words that God speaks to Adam. And then even when Adam reveals his guilt that he knew that he was naked because he had eaten from the forbidden tree, God still gives him another opportunity to repent. Have you eaten from the tree that I forbid you to eat from? But sin had so severely warped Adam's heart and his mind that he couldn't do it. In his heart, he couldn't love God enough to follow his commands and confess his sin. Adam's sin in his heart made him despise God's holiness and all of God's gracious gifts that God had given him, including the wonderful wife that Adam had been so enamored of just a chapter before. Rather than take the blame for his sin and fess up, rather than lay down his life for his wife as God has commanded husbands to be willing to do, Adam instead takes her and tosses her under the bus. He says, this wife that you put here with me, and in the original language, the word you is right out front. Adam is putting the blame squarely on God. You gave me this woman that she was supposed to be a blessing for me, and look what you've done. Eve didn't fare any better. God turned to her, gave her her chance to repent. Eve, what is this you have done? She passed the buck off on Satan. He deceived me, and I ate. You and I, just like Adam and Eve, we sin, and we sin every day. And daily God calls us back in repentance. He gives us opportunities to confess our sin. He calls to us when we read his word. Recognize how gracious our God is that he doesn't turn to us immediately and pummel us because of our sin, that his punishments do not pour out on us instantly because we've turned against him and turned to sin. The fact that he speaks to us at all is an act of pure grace. He, he, He holds off punishment, the punishment that we deserve, and he instead points out our guilt He tells us his law and shows us how far short we have fallen of his expectations. And that's not unloving. That's not harsh. That is pure love so that we turn to him in repentance and confess our sin. He calls to us with the pangs of a guilty conscience that remind us of our sin. Even your baptism, your blessed baptism, contains in it a call for you to repent when you're reminded that your sins were, were buried with Jesus and taken with him to the cross for the purpose that so that you could rise up today to live a whole new life, a life motivated with love for God and thankfulness for his forgiveness. God calls to you with the admonition of a fellow Christian, maybe a Christian spouse or a parent or even a son or daughter who points out or or helps you to see your sin. We can't do it on our own. We need God's gracious call to bring our sinful hearts to repentance. And so graciously he speaks to us. This is how God deals with his dear people. From, From the earliest chapters of Genesis all the way through to the end of time. Everything God wrote Here in Genesis chapter 3 about Adam and Eve was to teach us 
how God deals with his people. And there's something else very important here that I'd like us men especially to focus on for just a moment. Eve was the one who was tempted, right? She was the one who took the fruit from the tree and gave it to her husband. And Paul says the same thing in the New Testament. God knew exactly what had happened. But yet notice it wasn't Eve that God came to first and asked, what have you done? He had given the command to Adam before Eve was created that they were not to eat the fruit from the one tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God had given Adam the responsibility to lead his wife in that obedience, in that thankful love towards the Lord by helping her to follow God's command. God calls out first the ones that he has given the responsibility. Just like he has given husbands and fathers the responsibility to be leaders in their family. Guys, being the head doesn't mean that you make all the decisions for the family. Doesn't mean that you boss your family around. Means that you take responsibility for your family. And that includes taking responsibility for your own sin. It includes being willing to confess your sin and your guilt. Being willing to say things like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I got so angry. Please forgive me. Are you worried to say those words to your family? Are you worried they might lose respect for you if they found out you were a sinner? I'll tell you what. Your spouse, your children, they know already. (laughs) You can't hide it from people who are so close to you. And you won't lose respect from them. If you have a godly wife, if you have godly children, they will respect you, that you will take the leadership even in taking responsibility for your sin and your wife and your children will follow you with God's blessing and confess their sin as well and rejoice with you in in the freedom that we have from God's forgiveness. Be leaders in your family. God continued to act in grace toward Adam and Eve even after they refused to repent, even though they were unwilling. And he turns to the snake to whom Adam and Eve have all directed their their passed off the buck and he curses that snake and Satan with him right in front of Adam and Eve so that they could hear what God was saying About the snake. Listen to what God said to him. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Notice that even though God spoke kindly at first to Adam and Eve, and gave them an opportunity, really called out to them and allowed them a chance to repent, he does not give the devil that same chance. He turned immediately to the serpent and without an invitation, cursed him right in front of Adam and Eve. He would be the lowest of God's creatures. And every time Adam or Eve or any of their descendants saw a snake, they would be reminded of the sin that they had committed in the garden. And in fact, All of the curses that God called out on Adam and Eve, all of the consequences for for their sin, from toil and and hard labor and growing food to the pains in childbirth that God had promised to Eve, to even the, the looming specter of death that would hang over them all of their lives, all of those things are reminders, gracious reminders to Adam and Eve of their sin and their need for a Savior. They are calls to them to repent but not so for Satan. His judgment was already sealed. God pronounced against the father of lies no chance for him to repent. God's grace was not for him. He was already condemned to hell and without any hope of restoration or a relationship with God. God cursed Satan right there in front of Adam and Eve so that they could hear God's promise and put their faith and trust in God's promise that went with it. Where Eve had been in cahoots with the devil, 
and been on his side to bring about the fall into sin, God promised that he was going to break them apart, that he was going to bring enmity between the devil and Eve, between the devil's descendants and Eve's descendants, so that the people who, who did not believe in God, who followed Satan and his errors, would hate Eve's children, even Cain and Abel. Cain was not a follower of Christ, so he hated Abel and killed him. And finally, the Lord promised to send a particular seed, a descendant of the woman who would destroy the devil and his wicked work. Every Christmas, we look back to this passage in the first pages of the Bible and marvel again at how God gave the first promise to a sa- of a Savior immediately after Adam and Eve fell into sin. And throughout the whole Old Testament, God's people put their faith and trust in this promise as God revealed it to many different people in different ways to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah, to King David, and to all of the people of Israel through his prophets. And every time those people sinned against God and turned away from his commandments, he came back to them with the promise, I will send my servant who will destroy the devil's work and rescue you from sin. God, of course, fulfilled that promise by sending his son Jesus to be our Savior who would free us from the devil's deception when he allowed himself to be crucified on the tree of the cross. He was punished for Adam and Eve's sins and for all of our sins ever since when he suffered and died. And his words from the cross, it is finished, ring out across time and all the way back to the garden of of Eden to show us that this promise was finally fulfilled. Satan was crushed under his feet. Jesus was struck, yes, as the promise says, but Satan was destroyed forever. His power over Eve's descendants was broken when all of your sins were forgiven. And still today, you and I put our trust in God's promise for salvation that our Lord's suffering and death on the cross paid the price for our forgiveness and his death counts for us and gives us eternal life. The Lord assures us, just as he did Adam and Eve when they were forgiven, that our sins are washed away in Jesus' blood. When we sin, we know we have a God who deals with us graciously. We don't need to hide hide from our sins or hide our sins from God or from other Christians either. We have a God who who treats us graciously. Our God is the Lord. And so we can boldly and confidently confess our sin as he calls us to repentance and assures us of his forgiveness through Jesus. Amen. Please stand. The grace of God will soon crush Satan under your feet. To him be glory forever and ever through Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Join us for worship at the following times, like us on Facebook, or visit our website for audio and video sermons or to find out more about our congregation. God bless your week in the Lord.